In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this program entitled, Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. I wish to address, in the writings of the Servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, the theme of grace and God's will, in particular, sanctifying grace and the gift of living in the divine will. Here I make a distinction, or rather Jesus does in Louisa's text, between grace and gift. Oftentimes, these two nouns are used synonymously, but they are quite distinct. Grace and gift are distinct. Now, while all gifts are a grace from God, not all graces are gifts of the Holy Spirit. In the Catholic Catechism, as well as in Scripture, and in the Church's Code of Canon Law, it talks about grace and gifts. Now, there are different types of gifts from the Spirit. Some are ordinary, and some are extraordinary. Some are charismatic. Some are mystical. But gifts, as the Church Fathers relate, are not things the human being can engender by his or her own effort, but rather are gratuitous endowments from God Almighty, due to no merit of the individual creature. So, if someone has, for example, the mystical gift of the stigmata, right, which Luisa Picaretta had, in an invisible manner, like Catherine of Siena, both Third Order Dominicans, both of whom possess the gift of the invisible stigmata, which appeared on them after their death, well, that person receives that gift due to no merit of their own, but due to God's largesse. God gives his gifts to whom he wills, when he wills, and why he wills, and he never revokes his gifts. This is also a teaching of the Church Fathers. When God gives a gift, it is forever. Now, people can lose God's favor, people can lose an office, but the gifts that come from God are forever. Take, for example, baptism, right? Now, that is, while it's a theological gift, it's also a theological virtue. Baptism is a, is a sacrament that imparts to us um, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, right? Some theologians refer to the effects of baptism, namely faith, hope, and love, as not only theological virtues, but also theological gifts. Let me rephrase that. When we receive the sacrament of baptism, the Holy Spirit comes to us in such a way that infused in the soul are faith, hope, and love, expelling by vir by virtue of the admission of a greater love, namely faith, hope, and love, which is God, um, a lesser love, which is original sin. Now, some may think, well, why is sin a love? In the writings of Louisa, Jesus makes it clear that whatever we do, whether it's good or bad, we do out of love for something. So if we do evil, it's because we love evil. If we do good, it's because we love good. And in the end, we are judged by love, you see. When we are baptized, God's love, which is greater than Satan's, which is a disordered love, by the way, but it's still a love, the evil love of Satan, God's love, which is greater, forces out that lesser love, which is original sin. So faith, hope, and love, grace is from God, right? are infused within the soul. Now, in the act of the infusion of God's faith, hope, and love, these theological virtues 
what happens is the soul is sanctified, but at the same time, immediately, it is justified. It is sanctified by the admission of faith, hope, and love, and it is justified by the expulsion of original sin. So the action of sanctification and justification are contemporaneous. Now, some theologians refer to these three effects of God's love entering the soul at the moment of baptism through the form of faith, hope, and love as theological gifts, not just theological virtues. Now, what's the difference? I mentioned this in passing in a previous program. A gift is freely given by God. A virtue is engendered by the action of the human being. It is merited. So, theologically speaking, faith, hope, and love are first and foremost theological gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why are they gifts? Because we did nothing to merit them. Rather, God, out of his gratuity and love, imparts to the human creature these theological gifts of faith, hope, and love. Now, as the soul matures in its spiritual journey, arrives at the age of reason and begins to discern right from wrong, deliberate, choosing the good and avoiding the evil, now it begins to amass merit. Now, how does it amass merit? In the discernment process, in referring to the conscious, conscience of the human soul, which God gives it, whereby it is enabled to discern right from wrong without any formal teaching in general terms, in that moment, the soul is amassing merit by exercising right reason. Now, that exercise of right reason is an act of virtue. Therefore, the soul's decisions from right reason are virtuous acts. All the soul's virtuous acts are an exercise of faith, hope, and love. It is in this sense that one refers to faith, hope, and love as theological virtues. To rephrase, faith, hope, and love at the moment of their concession are theological gifts, freely imparted to the soul, due to no merit of its own. But at, when the soul arrives at the age of reason and makes virtuous choices and actions, the exercise of faith, hope, and love are now referred to as theological virtues, you see, because the soul now exercises faith, hope, and love, whereas when they're given, the soul does not exercise them. They're infused, due to no effort of the soul, freely infused in the soul by God. When the soul arrives at mature, um, adulthood, maturity, now it puts these three theological gifts to the test. It begins to exercise them, hence theological virtues. All right. Now, when we're speaking of the writings of Louisa, in her illustrations of the applications of the one grace of God that disposes and sanctifies the soul in the divine will, Louisa suggests what the scholastics refer to as sanctifying and actual grace that endow human nature with respectively an habitual aptitude and a disposition to perform virtuous acts. All right. Here I'm introducing you now to grace. I briefly touched upon the gift of faith, hope, and love that comes from the sacrament of baptism. And we can also refer to baptism as a gift as well, inasmuch as it is a a blessing, a benefit freely given by God due to no merit of the recipient. But that gift is also a sacrament, right? That Christ, one of the seven that Christ instituted. And it has effects, which are faith, hope, and love. And these are gifts as well, in as much as they are too freely given by God. And when they are exercised, they become virtues, all right? Now, when we speak of grace... In the writings of Louisa, we encounter sanctifying and actual applications to the word grace. 
Many of you are familiar with the word or expression sanctifying grace and actual grace. Well, let me add to that list based on the writings of the scholastics. The scholastics compartmentalize different applications of grace, especially Aquinas, and they go by many adjectives. I'll just list a few to recall things you were taught in Sunday school or at catechetical t classes. For example, efficacious grace. Paul speaks of that. Uh, I mentioned sanctifying actual grace. You also have habitual grace, cooperating grace, right? Natural grace, and the list goes on and on. Now, this habitual, when I speak of habitual aptitude, as I mentioned when I address sanctifying and actual grace, which is really an habitual aptitude and a disposition to perform virtuous acts, what I mean by that is that grace is understood to be a quality within the soul that is permanent, hence habitual. Sanctifying grace is received at baptism. Remember I spoke of, at the moment of baptism, the soul being sanctified and justified at the same time? It is sanctified because the soul is endowed with faith, hope, and love. And in that moment of endowment, original sin is expelled. Okay, so it's sanctified and justified. This sanctification is habitual in the soul. Once you're baptized, you cannot be unbaptized, for example. Once you're ordained a priest, you cannot be unordained a priest. All right? So sanctifying grace that occurs at baptism is an habitual aptitude, which is understood to be a quality within the soul known as sanctifying grace. In Latin, it's also known as gratia habitualis, which is also habitual grace. So sanctifying grace, gratia sanctivis, uh, sanctifying grace, sorry, gratia habitualis, is the same thing as sanctifying grace. Habitual grace, sanctifying grace. It is also understood to produce a permanent condition. It is not to be confounded with actual grace, Okay, now, I know these terms can be a little bit prolixic, but remember, these come from the scholastics. And this is why I wish to address them. Because Louisa, remember, was a third-order Dominican. And in her writings, we find a lot of these expressions used by the scholastics. St. Thomas Aquinas was a Dominican, right? Catherine of Siena. So she speaks of sanctifying or habitual grace as a permanent disposition of the soul, to turn to God, to do good and avoid evil. And she also speaks of actual grace. Actual grace, unlike sanctifying grace, is a series of interventions, we may call them, or um, communications by God to the soul. Sanctifying and actual grace are united in their work of perfecting the soul and enabling it to freely renounce all sinful action in order to cooperate with God's divine will. While the Louisian expression, sanctifying grace, actual grace, is also found, of course, before Louisa in the catechisms of Trent and so forth, um, they mean the same thing. Actual grace, right, it's a series of communications from God, whereas sanctifying grace is a permanent endowment of God to the soul at the moment of baptism that remains with it throughout its life. And throughout its life, God continues to communicate to the soul through actual grace. Louisa uses different expressions with regard to sanctifying and actual grace. Let me refer to some of her expressions in, with respect to actual grace, these interventions, that communications that come to the soul by God throughout its life. She uses one expression, for example, long chain of graces. This comes from volume 11, September 16th, 1913. 
He also used this same expression, long chain of graces, that is given to the soul who lives in God's divine will, in volume 12 on February 13, 1990, and in volume 17 on May 10, 1925. This long chain of graces that accompanied her acts in the divine will are described also by her as a continuous, great, unheard of, surprising, and astonishing work of God. Okay? Now, continuous is not the same thing as permanent, right? Continuous can be interrupted. Here, she describes God's actual grace in the soul, in her soul, who lived in the divine will, and in the souls of those who live in the divine will, as continuous on October 25th, 1903, she mentions this. She also refers to actual grace as God's great communications on, on October 12th, 1899, in volume 2. She refers to actual grace as unheard of and surprising and astonishing graces that God gives to the soul who lives in his will, respectively, in volume 11, May 25th, 1916, in the Blessed Virgin Mary book, on day 4, and in volume 12 on May 22nd, 1919. These actual graces, however astonishing, surprising, unheard of, great, continuous they might be, are united in the work of sanctifying and actual grace that dispose the soul to live in God's divine will. Otherwise put, Louise's expressions of God's workings in her soul and in the souls who live in the divine will are nothing other than God's action of grace in the soul through sanctification. Although the human mind cannot fully fathom the manner in which God's will operates in the soul through grace in order to absorb and divinize its finite actions, Jesus reveals that the various applications of his one grace that were necessary for the gift of living in the divine will are unique. God's grace that disposed Louisa for the gift of living in his will is exemplified in Jesus having infused in her, in quotes, new prodigies of grace never done before. This expression comes from volume 14, March 24th, 1922, volume 11, September 12th, 1913, volume 16, May 24th, 1924. Okay. Now, these new prodigies of grace never done before are God's divine communications to the soul, interventions, if you will, of sanctifying and actual grace. They dispose the soul for the fullness of grace. And this expression, fullness of grace, is found in the Bible with regard to Mary, and also in volume 16, on, November, on September 21st, 1923, with regard to the soul who lives in God's divine will. In her writings, Louisa illustrates the importance of the sacraments, right, and of the dispositions of those who receive them in the actualization of the gift of living in God's divine will. Up till now, I spoke of sanctifying grace, actual grace, and the various adjectives Louisa attaches to them, such as great, unheard of, surprising, astonishing, etc., now let me talk about sacramental grace. To effectively convey the complementarity between the sacraments and the divine will, worthy of mention are the following considerations on sacramental grace. Consider, for example, Jesus established the Church as a visible institution with external realities. These are known as sacraments. These external realities, or sacraments, contain internal realities, namely, grace, the grace they signify. In the case of the sacraments, it's sacramental grace. In fact, 
the early ecumenical council states, in quotes, If anyone shall say that the sacraments of the new law, meaning the gospel, do not contain the grace which they signify, or that they do not confer that grace on those who do not place an obstacle in the way, let them be anathema. Unquote. This expression comes from the Council of Early Ecumenical Council as well Lateran as well as the Council of Trent. Because Christ shed his blood to strengthen man through the sacraments, and to provide for him a guaranteed administration of his grace, it really is inappropriate to consider them optional. And this is why ecumenism is very important today. Remember, Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants are all members of Christ's mystical body. They are all baptized in Christ. And they all have a right to three sacraments, Canon 844 underscores. Now, I use that word right. They all have a right because it comes from Pope John Paul II's encyclical when he speaks of the Eastern churches and the non-Eastern churches, namely Protestant, um, in the context of them receiving confession, communion, and anointing of the sick. Now, I will speak more on this later. In fact, I wrote an article in this regard, quoting Pope John Paul II's encyclical on ecumenism. In, when he encourages all the baptized to approach the sacraments worthily, that is, through confession. And when I say sacraments, he speaks specifically of three, as does the Code of Canon Law, 844. And that is confession, communion, and anointing of the sick. Certainly, certain conditions are required. And I will go into that in a future talk. I'll just mention very briefly... Um, one of the conditions required of a non-Catholic receiving these three sacraments properly is that they approach it by themselves, that they don't have a minister that's able to administer these sacraments to them, and that there is a grave reason. Now, the grave reason is articulated in a document put out there by the Archdiocese of Rockville Center. Okay, And that's in the article I wrote as well. But more on that later. For now, may it suffice to say that the sacraments contain both external and internal realities. The external are the sacraments themselves, external signs that convey internal realities, namely God's sacramental grace. Now, while I'm on this topic, let me ask the listener a question, a little quiz on your catechism. What makes a sacrament valid? The answer is twofold, matter and form. If one of the two is lacking, the sacrament is invalid. What, for example, is the matter and form in baptism? The matter is water. The form are the words that the minister recites, invoking the three persons of the Trinity, if the form or the matter is lacking, the sacrament is invalid. Both have to be present. Another example, confession. What is the matter and form in confession? The matter is contrition on the part of the penitent. If there is no contrition, the sacrament is invalid. What is the form? the words of absolution the priest recites. Again, if one of the two is lacking, it is an invalid sacrament. Now, with regard to contrition, let me specify the word contrition as distinct from attrition. Okay? The Catechism relates that attrition, which is imperfect contrition, otherwise put, the fear of hell only, Attrition is only the fear of hell, not the love of God. That is sufficient to take away venial sin. It is insufficient to take away grave mortal sin. The fear of hell is insufficient to take away grave mortal sin. Contrition is love of God. That is sufficient to take away grave 
mortal sin as well as venial sin. So while attrition, which is the fear of hell, which is imperfect contrition, suffices to take away only venial sin and not grave sin, contrition takes away both, which is love of God. And this is why I prefer over all other forms of penitence, acts of contrition, the following form. O oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended Thee. I detest all my sins, because, here comes attrition, I dread the loss of, I dread the pains of hell, the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, and here comes contrition, but most of all because I have offended Thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. And here comes the third part of resolution. I firmly resolve, with the help of thy grace, to confess my sins, to do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. That is a perfectly composed act of contrition. It doesn't get any better than that. I don't think people should change that. I mean, of course, God will forgive anyone with a contrite heart in whatever words they say, certainly. But I like this form composed by the church because it has it all. It has attrition, the fear of hell, it has contrition, the love of God, and it has a firm resolution not to sin again. All right, now moving back on to the writings of Louisa, before I get back into her sacramental grace theology, let me remind you that Radio Maria depends upon your generosity to continue to bring to you these programs pertaining to different areas of theology, sacramentology, Biblical theology, moral theology, um, current events in the church today, and so on and so forth. So we are grateful for your continued support. Some of you may have heard the expression in Latin from your catechetical days, ex, ex, opere, O-P-E-R-E, operato. O-P-E-R-A-T-O. Now, these three funky Latin words, what do they mean? It really means literally. Now, Latin cannot always be translated literally because the syntax is off. It doesn't follow the English syntax. But it means from the work performed. Ex, from, opere, the work, operato, operated. From the work performed, okay? Now, it means that the efficacy of the action of the sacraments does not depend on anything human, but solely on the will of God, as expressed by Christ's institution and promise. Otherwise put, the priest, when he administers confession and communion, or baptism, or matrimony, whatever other sacraments he may administer, anointing of the sick, even if he is unworthy in the moment of his administration of the sacrament, the sacrament is valid. Why? It does not depend upon the priest, does not depend upon the administrator of the sacrament. It could be a lay person administering baptism or marriage. With a dispensation of the bishop, this can be done. Even anointing of the sick can be done by laity with the permission of the bishop. Let's suppose a layperson or a cleric is not in a worthy state to administer the sacrament. By virtue of ex opere operato, this teaching in Latin, which comes from the councils, by the way, that's why it's in Latin. In the early centuries of the church, all the documents were in Latin, and today even. All the documents are first issued in Latin from Rome and then translated into the vernacular so that we can understand them. This means that, and it's a doctrine based on Scripture and on the writings of the Church Fathers and doctors, that the sacraments Christ instituted do not depend on anything human, no human disposition, but on God's will. All right, this brings us to another question. How do we know that a priest, or how does the priest himself know that he has validly affected the consecration. I spoke of the matter and form making valid the sacraments of baptism and confession. Let's now address communion. What is the matter and form in communion that makes the sacrament valid? The matter is the bread and wine, 
so no other element can be used. If a priest uses peach juice, or soda, coke, <laughs> or milk, it is invalid, the consecration of the wine, of the blood of Christ. Or if he uses any other element than bread, right? That's invalid as well. Now, in the Western Church, unleavened bread is, in canon law, required for licity, not validity, licity, okay? Meaning, uh, that's the Church's law in the West. Whereas in the East, the Orthodox, they don't have it leavened, and it's still valid, but they have a different code of canon law, that's why they do it that way. But what makes it valid is the bread. Now, what is the form of communion? The words, the consecratory words the priest recites, the Eucharistic prayer. In particular, the words of consecration. If the priest deliberately, that's the key word, deliberately, changes or alters the words of consecration, it's an invalid consecration. If due to ignorance or uh, frailty, a senior priest just, I don't know, mix, forgets a word or two, indeliberately, that doesn't make the, the sacrament invalid, you see. God sees the intentionality of the priest. And priests, to ensure that they do affect validly the sacrament, say prayers before the Mass that are found in the back of the sacramentary. I do it before every Mass. It's a prayer to the Blessed Mother, and it's a prayer to God the Father, where the priest asks that he that he states that it is his intention to consecrate the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ according to the rite of the Holy Roman Church, etc. And then he asks God, asks God to accompany him. Now, with regard to Louisa and her theology on sacramental grace, she emphasizes that in order to live in the divine will, one must frequent the sacrament of confession and communion often. Yes, she does. And she went to both of them as often as she could. And she would even struggle, suffer interiorly, if she was deprived of the sacrament of communion. Now, certainly in her initial years, when she was an adolescent and learning the ways of grace and God, she would resist a little bit to tell the priest all of her small sins. Now, let me remind you, God told Louisa that she never committed one grave sin in her entire life. Just bear, keep that in mind. So when she went to confession, she was telling the priest venial sins. And sometimes she would withhold some deliberately out of embarrassment, out of timidity. Um, and Jesus intervened and re reproved her. He said, you should tell the priest everything. Now, does this mean that all laity are obliged to tell the priest every venial sin for the sacrament to be valid? No. The Church makes that quite clear in the Catechism. But it's recommended. It's not compulsory, but it's recommended that when we confess, we go to the priest with two things in mind, two ends, nature and number. This is a simple way to remember how to confess. All we have to tell the priest is the nature of our sin and the number of our sin. So the nature, is it grave or is it venial? And the number, how often? And that's it. We have to go with a contrite heart, of course. And this is how Louisa was trained by Jesus to confess. She did not know how to confess that well. So he would tell her not to deliberately conceal anything, but to be an open book to her confessor, and eventually she complied and pleased the Lord that way. Um, although the administration of the sacrament is guaranteed, whether it be confession, communion, its fruitful or worthy reception depends on the worthiness of the recipient. So if ex opere operato means that above and beyond the human person's dis, um, state, above and beyond the state of the person who administers the sacrament, the sacrament is given. Ex opere operantis means that 
the recipient of the sacrament can receive more or less grace based on their disposition. Okay, let me state that again to make it clear. Ex opere operato, from the work performed in Latin, means that regardless of the person who administers the sacrament's state, the sacrament is given 100%. However, the recipient may receive more or less grace depending upon how they approach the sacrament, whether or not they are more or less recollected, prepared for the sacrament, you see. And that's known in Latin as ex opere operantis. Although the administration of the sacrament is guaranteed by the administrator, well, it's by God through the administrator, its fruitful or worthy reception depends on the worthiness of the recipient. The Council of Trent was careful to note that there must not be any obstacle to grace on the part of the recipients who are to receive the sacraments. And Trent declared it erroneous to assert that the sacraments require no previous dispositions on the part of the recipient. Such dispositions are required to prepare the recipient. They are a condition and not the cause of the grace conferred. While Louisa affirms that the recipient's dispositions are not the cause of grace conferred by the sacraments, but the sacraments themselves, she acknowledges that such dispositions nonetheless condition in the soul the sacrament's efficacy. She, she articulates this in Volume 12 on December 26, 1919. Okay. Um... Jesus here tells her, I'll quote this, just one sentence from this large paragraph. The sacraments operate according to the disposition of souls. This is Jesus talking to Louisa. The sacraments operate according to the dispositions of souls. And sometimes the sacraments are even less fruitless, I'm sorry, are even left fruitless, unable to confer the good they contain. Unquote. So, for the recipient to acquire the proper dispositions, it must resign itself to God's will. This is found in the writings of Louisa. Although Jesus' timeless humanity that divinized all human activity helps dispose all souls, the soul must cooperate with him, with God's activity. This is known as grace because God helps us dispose ourselves to receive him worthily in the Eucharist, in confession, and in the other sacraments. Consider the following expression taken from Volume 12, October 24th, 1918. Here Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, for the soul to have all the necessary means to receive me in communion, I wanted to institute the sacrament on the last day of my life so as to line up the divine acts of my entire life around each host, in anticipation for each soul who would receive me in communion. Souls could never have received me if they had not been prepared by God. See that? God prepares us to receive him. He helps dispose us through grace. Souls could never have received me if they had not been prepared by God, who, moved by a pure excess of love, desired to give himself to them. Since without God's preparation, souls were unable to receive me, the same excess of love brought me to offer my entire life as a preparation for each soul. Thus I placed my steps, my works, my love, before those of each soul. And since my passion also existed within me, I also placed my pains before those of each soul in order to prepare them. So cloak yourself with my humanity, cover yourself with each one of my acts to come to me. Unquote. He reiterates this also in volume 23 on October 10th, 1927. 
So Jesus helps dispose us to receive him who comes to us in the sacrament of communion, and each consecrated host that we receive is surrounded by his divine acts, all lined up for us to receive. And the more we receive Jesus in communion, the more infusions of his will we receive in life. The more we penetrate the center of his divine will. Now, the soul as I mentioned, must cooperate with God to receive him worthily in the Eucharist. And the soul cooperates with him in disposing itself in the following four steps. These are found in Louisa's volumes. The first step for the soul to cooperate with God is for it to resign itself to God's will. The second step is for the soul to desire to do his will in all things in making his will its daily bread, and in immersing itself in the divine will, whereby it consummates the will of God within its own will. So the four steps again. Step number one, the soul resigns itself to God's will. Step number two, the soul desires to do God's will in all things. Step number three, the soul makes God's will its daily bread. And step number four, the soul immerses itself in the divine will by consummating its the will of God within its own will. And these steps can be found in volume 6, November 8th, 1905. If the soul does not take the first step, however, that is, if the soul does not resign itself to God's will, it remains empty of God, cannot receive him worthily. And no sooner does the soul properly resign itself than God immediately communicates to it his grace in ever-increasing measure. When the properly disposed soul fruitfully receives the Eucharist, Jesus empowers it to multiply itself in every one of the past, present, and future. This is found in Volume 12 on October 17, 1917. Consider the following excerpt. My daughter, the first act that I did was to multiply my life in as many lives as there are souls who will exist, so that each one of them might have one life of mine all to itself, a life that continuously prays, thanks, satisfies, and loves this soul alone. In the same way I multiplied my pains for each soul, as if I were suffering only for that soul and not for others. In that supreme moment of receiving myself, I gave myself to everyone. Here Jesus is referring to the Last Supper, when he received himself, okay? So let me repeat that. In the supreme moment of receiving myself, I gave myself to everyone. I suffered my passion in each heart to conquer them through my pains and my love. Through the complete offering of my divinity, I claimed dominion over all things. But alas, my love remained disappointed in many. Hence I anxiously await loving hearts who, in receiving me, will unite with me to multiply themselves in every one, who desire and want what I want, so that I may receive at least from these what others fail to give me, and receive the joy of having them conformed to my desire and to my will. Unquote. So here Jesus is affirming that the properly disposed soul fruitful who fruitfully receives Jesus in the Eucharist, is empowered by him to multiply itself in everyone, just as Jesus did, whereby it gives him complete glory. And this complete glory is articulated in volume 11, February 24th, 1917. Because Jesus' will contains all the power of all the sacraments combined, reception of the sacraments procures for the soul a new encounter with him, and an increased participation in his divine will. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 12 on June 20th, 1918, 
In quotes, I possess the sacraments within my heart. I am their owner, and I can exercise them whenever I want. Unquote. He also tells her on December 26, 1919, My will is sacred and holy, and it contains all the power of the sacraments combined. Unquote. This makes perfect theological sense if you consider that the Catechism states that we, the priests, will consecrate Christ until he comes again. It means that the priests stop the consecration when Christ returns in the flesh. In other words, all the sacraments cease when Christ returns in the flesh. There is no more need for baptism. There will be no more need for confession, for communion, for anointing of the sick, for marriage. All the sacraments come to an end when Christ returns in the flesh. Why? Because Christ, who contains all the sacraments and all their power, when he draws us all into himself at the wedding feast, where the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and the bride and the bridegroom have that nuptial marriage in Revelation chapter 21 and 2, the book of Revelation, all the sacraments return to him from whence they came, along with us. We become definitively his body of which, of uh, the mystical body of Christ, of which he is the head. Okay? And therefore, until Christ comes again in the flesh, we must, we ought to receive him in the sacraments often. It is a powerhouse of divine um, grace and gifts. As noted, Louisa acknowledges that the divine acts that await their actualization in all humans are present in every sacramentally consecrated host. Think of that. All the divine acts that Louisa received when she received the gift of living in the divine will and progressed in it, all the divine acts that the Blessed Virgin Mary possessed because of her gift, because of the gift she received of living in the divine will, all the divine acts that Jesus himself possessed by virtue of the gift of living in the divine will, are present in every sacramentally consecrated host. Jesus tells this to Louisa in volume 11 on February 24th, 1917. Consider the following expression. My daughter, in the small circumference of the host, I enclose everything. And this is why I wanted to receive myself to do complete acts that would glorify my Father worthily, and to enable souls to receive God. And I gave to souls the complete fruit of my sacramental life. This is why in each host there are my prayers, thanksgiving, and all else that is needed to glorify my Father, and which souls were supposed to do for me. So if the soul falters, I nonetheless continue my designs in each host, as if I were receiving myself again for each soul. Therefore, the soul must transform itself into me to form one single operation with me, making my life, my prayers, my groans of love, my pains, and my fiery heartbeats its own the fiery heartbeats with which I wish to ignite them. But I find no one who abandons himself as prey to the loving flames of my heart. In this host I am reborn. I live, I die, and I consume myself. But I find no one who consumes himself for me. Yet, if the soul repeats what I do, I feel my life reenacted, as if I were receiving myself once again, and I find complete glory, divine joys, and outpourings of love that match mine, whereby I impart to the soul the grace of being consumed in my own consummation. Unquote. 
If in the fiat of redemption Jesus instituted for mankind the sacraments as a means to heal and to lead souls to glory to God in safety, in the fiat of sanctification God procures for mankind the divine will as a sacrament that, like a new baptism, confers upon the soul the fullness of grace. Yes, Jesus does refer to the divine will as a sacrament, and the Second Vatican Council refers to the Church as a sacrament also. This does not mean we're changing the number of the seven sacraments, no. The Council of Trent made it quite clear that no one can add to or subtract to the number of seven sacraments. So when Jesus uses the word divine will as a sacrament, or when the Vatican, Second Vatican Council uses the, the word the church as a sacrament, they're not adding to the number seven. They're using it as follows. I will first read this text to you from Louisa and explain how sacrament is used in regard to the church and to the divine will. On volume 12, in volume 12, on December 26, 1919, Jesus tells Louisa, My will need not labor to, it's a long excerpt here, so let me choose this concisely, My will need not labor to dispose the soul to receive the treasure it contains. For as soon as the soul has disposed itself under the action of my grace to do my will at the cost of any sacrifice, my will, finding everything prepared and disposed, communicates itself to the soul without delay, pouring forth the treasures it contains to form heroes, martyrs of the divine will, the most unheard of portents. What do the sacraments do, if not unite the soul to God? Do they not perhaps unite the will of the human creature to that of its Creator? And of what does doing my will consist? Does it not consist of completely losing oneself in the eternal will? And he continues in this, in this fashion. Then he adds, My will is sacrament, and it surpasses, excuse me, and it surpasses all the sacraments combined, but in a more admirable way, that is, without mediation from anyone, and without matter. The sacrament of my will is formed between my will and the will of the soul. The two wills are bound together and form the sacrament. My will is life, and the soul that is already um, that is already disposed receives life. My will is holy, and the soul receives holiness. It is strong, and the soul receives fortitude, and so on with respect to all else. On the other hand, how my other sacraments must labor to dispose souls, if at all they succeed. Only the sacrament of my will can acclaim glory and victory. Okay, that's an excerpt from the entire passage there, where Jesus basically is informing us of how his divine will is considered a sacrament. Inasmuch as the, all the sacraments unite the soul to God, that is the sacrament of baptism, confirmation, confession, communion, so the gift of living in his divine will unites the soul to God. However, the gift of living in the divine will cannot unite the soul to God unless it disposes itself. In those four steps I mentioned earlier, step one, it must resign itself to God's will. Step two, it must desire his will in all things. Step three, it must make his will its daily bread and for immerse itself in his will, consummating the will of God within its own will. These are the four steps Jesus reiterates to Louisa and that I share with you. All right, let me pause there. May God bless you and keep you till next time in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.